This is Matthew Cratter from Bitcoin University, and today I wanted to talk about the genius of Jerome Powell. I'm taking this title from a Washington Post article by Matthew Iglesias called The Economic and Political Genius of Jay Powell, of who is, of course, the head of the Fed in the U.S., our central bank. Matthew Iglesias, if you don't know who he is, he writes the, the aptly titled Slow and Boring Blog for Bloomberg. And he's had a view, as you might imagine, a negative view of Bitcoin since 2013. Back in 2013, he said his primary interest in Bitcoin was that it was a great platform for making jokes about. And then he made a very interesting comment, which turned out to be prescient, though in a way that he could never have intended. Bitcoin is a 21st century version of gold whose primary appeal is as a speculative asset purchased by people with an irrational fear of inflation. And it looks like Bitcoiners were correct to be afraid of inflation. And this was another article that I imagine Matthew is eating crow about. He was also, surprisingly, a large fan of Sam Bankman Freed, gushing over his commitment to effective altruism. And now, as this article points out, Iglesias is dutifully eating crow and looks quite embarrassed for having rejected Bitcoin but supported a crypto guy like Sam Bankman Freed. But let's approach this title, The Genius of Jerome Powell, and do our own analysis of how well the Fed has been doing and how well Jerome Powell has been doing. And then we'll return to that article and see what Iglesias has to say about it. And in order to grade the Fed, we're going to use the Fed's own stated man mandates. You may have heard about the dual mandate of the Fed, which includes these two prongs, maximum employment and price stability. In other words, trying to control inflation. It does have a not so secret third mandate, which we won't really be talking about today. But if you've been around for the past 25 years, watching the markets, you know that their secret third mandate is to bail out the stock market or the bond market whenever they need to. And this was a mandate that was pioneered by Alan Greenspan and then used by subsequent Fed chairs. And this is where we get this idea of the Greenspan put, Bernanke put, Yellen put, and the Powell put as well. The Powell put did not work too well in 2022, obviously. Let's go through their mandates though one at a time their official mandates. And we'll start with the second one, mandate number two, which is price stability and concerns the Fed making sure that inflation is neither too high nor too low, which is ironic since the Fed is actually the main source of price instability in the U.S. and in the U.S. dollar. Decades of inflation since the founding of the central bank in 1913 have massively eroded the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar. $1 in 2020 was equivalent to about $26 in terms of purchasing power when the Fed was founded, when the Federal Reserve was founded in 1913 in a secret meeting over Christmas when no one was watching. So when it comes to price stability, the Fed is not that nice fireman who comes by your house to put out a fire. The Fed and all the other central banks are actually the arsonists, in my opinion. If you're enjoying this video so far, I just ask you to hit that subscribe button. That would really help out the reach of this channel. So central banks, they like to monetize government deficit spending by printing up fresh US dollars and buying government bonds. And we can see the Fed's balance sheet, how much it's expanded since the early 2000s being under a trillion. And then at the peak of the uh, bubble a couple years ago, reaching about nine trillion. And they're now trying to slowly draw this balance sheet down. Unfortunately, it's going to probably be going the opposite way in the coming years. And it's going to end up instead of being at eight and a half trillion, it's probably going to be at 20 trillion, 30 trillion, 40 trillion. The result of this is the inflation, the crippling inflation that we've been seeing. Half of New York City households faced a cost of, cost of living crisis. They should really just call this the central banker crisis rather than the cost of living crisis because this is who has been causing it. Another article about the cost of living crisis from 2023. So for all of these reasons, I would give the Fed an F grade when it comes to managing price stability, though that's a little bit weird since it's like giving an arsonist an F in firefighting. They're not really uh, doing what they uh, they should be. Now, what about their other mandate of quote unquote maximum employment? Here's a key point to understand when talking about the U.S. unemployment rate. It's a very weird way that the government measures it and massages the statistic. So if you're looking for a job and then you give up looking for a job, which usually only happens when you win the lottery, which is extremely rare, or because the job market is so bad, which is becoming increasingly common. If you give up looking for that job, you are no longer counted in this government statistic. You no longer contribute to the unemployment rate. That's right, whenever someone gives up due to desperation, the unemployment number goes down and politicians and central bankers 
can brag about it. If you want to get a better idea of what the true unemployment rate is, we can look at the labor force participation rate, which has really been falling since the late 1990s. And it's certainly been falling over the term that Powell has been serving at the Federal Reserve. So I would give Powell and the Fed an F as well when it comes to maximizing employment. This is, quote unquote, the genius of Jerome Powell. This is actually a silly mandate, too, when you think about it, maximizing employment, because what in the world would a bunch of bureaucrats know about creating jobs? They're literally all lawyers and central bankers, as is Powell. Powell used to be a lawyer, then an investment banker, then a long-term government employee. I believed he worked under George Bush Sr. One thing Powell definitely knows about is how to maximize his own net worth through pursuing the greatest rent-seeking jobs. If you think about lawyers, investment bankers, and then government employees, these are the three, probably the three greatest ways you can rent seek short of becoming a central banker, which he now is. So what does Matthew Iglesias think about all of this when he talks about the genius of Jay Powell? This article contains so many pure howlers, I have to say. Here's one from Iglesias. It was Powell's flexible average inflation targeting program put in place shortly below the pandemic that allowed the Fed to let inflation rise above 2% in order to restore the full employment and it worked. So according to Matthew Iglesias in this article, we should praise Jerome Powell because he printed a lot of money, he caused a lot of inflation, and then he moved the goalposts to justify higher inflation, all while the labor participation rate fell and the cost of living skyrocketed so much that even people who are working full-time now in the U.S. and Canada and other places in Europe can no longer afford basic necessities like food and shelter. Is this somehow genius? Maybe Iglesias has a different definition of genius than most people. Or maybe Matthew Iglesias is just an establishment bootlicker, like most people in the mainstream media. Here's another howler from the article. Powell sent the message that the Fed was prepared to do what it took to bring inflation down, even if that meant real economic pain. As it turns out, very little pain has been necessary. When I read this, it's hard to imagine where Matthew Iglesias has been living for the past two years, whether he's been living under a rock. How out of touch with the realities of everyday Americans are you required to be in order to become a journalist and say that there's very little pain out there right now? Here's a final howler. Quote, most of the inflation fighting is over and it happened without the recession that many observers feared would be necessary. Iglesias seems in this passage to have forgotten the part where the Fed hiked so fast and furiously that it blew up the whole U.S. banking system earlier this year and then they had to print money for the BT. FP program, the bank term funding program, which I'll link to in the description notes below. We can see that these emergency loans are still being taken out and are currently above $107 billion for the most recent reading. Lastly, we have Jerome Powell's speech at Jackson Hole in Wyoming last week, in which he said that the, the line that really jumped out to me was, quote, we are navigating by the stars under cloudy skies. That is actually quite an admission of how blind they are. And that really inspires a lot of confidence. How many economists are there in the Fed's payroll? How repeatedly wrong have they been over the past decade, century? Why are people on Bitcoin Twitter seem to be so much smarter about these things than the Fed and its economists are? And also, why doesn't anyone ever get fired? Why does Christine Lagarde get indicted and then be brought back? Janet Yellen say there's never going to be another crisis in our lifetimes, and then she gets brought back. These people just do not go away, even when they're incredibly wrong, as Powell and the Fed were in the last few years when they said that inflation was transitory and temporary. And we went from inflation isn't going to happen, it happened due to bottlenecks, etc., all the way down this line. Conclusion, Powell is making monetary policy as we've talked about Keynesian pseudoscience. He's making monetary policy based on pseudoscience, and he and other central bankers do not have a good track record. In fact, the longer that Powell keeps interest rates this high, or even raises them more as there were rumblings of coming out of Jackson Hole, the greater the chances of a severe stock or bond market crash this fall. And if Matthew Iglesias is in the soft landing camp, as he appears to be from this article, that actually really makes me want to be more in the hard landing camp. It's important to remember that monetary policy operates at something like a 12 to 24 month lag, call it an 18 month lag. And so things could definitely begin to get ugly this fall. I believe the Fed started raising rates in March of 2022, roughly around then. And so it's been about, or will have been about 18 months pretty soon, and we will see what happens. Things could definitely begin to get ugly this fall if Powell does not relent in some way. And as you probably know, September and October are notorious months 
for stock market crashes. This raises the question, should you trade in and out of your Bitcoin position to try to avoid a dip? I don't think so. I think we could even see a scenario where the stock market falls and Bitcoin stays bid. It still stays around 25,000 or somewhere around here due to the upcoming BlackRock ETF and, and fund flows trying to front run that. So I would say just hodl on going into the fall and we can take Iglesias 2013 advice about Bitcoin to heart, Bitcoin being a 21st century version of gold that is purchased by people with a fear of inflation. This fear of inflation, as we said, turned out to be quite well founded and I think will continue to be if and when the Fed blows things up even further. That means the money printers are gonna have to run that much harder to bail everything out and to put out the fire that the Fed arsonists have once again started. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.